So this is uh, the last message in this series that we're doing, um, and we're going to get into things. So this is Q&A. If you have not uh, been here for a little bit, or if you've been intermittent, of course, there's always going back on various uh, forms of media, our podcast, our website, our YouTube channel, all the stuff, right? So check those out if, they, if you're so inclined. But this is part 10 of our series. That just means summer's over with, <laughs> right? So I said, yeah, I was starting a thing through summer here. So we've been tag teaming this, and um, we've been covering the 10 most common objections to Christianity. So that's, that's what this series has really been addressing. And uh, I've said it, you know, it's it maybe, for me it goes without saying, but um, it stretches me a little bit because these are, you know, I'm not saying I'm comfortable with all this stuff, but, but I'm being stretched and I'm just uh, relying uh, completely on God's grace to, just to walk through these things, but it's, it's good information and uh, we're just going to get into part 10 here. So let's take a look at our final uh, question of this series. Uh, why is there evil and suffering in the world? Why is there evil and suffering in the world? And the few messages that I've done, I've said you could answer them in a, just a statement, and that'd be it, and we can walk out. Uh, wouldn't that be something? But we're not going to do that. So um, common questions uh, we hear uh, are things along these lines. So when you, this question that I've just posed, or that we're, we're looking at this week, usually there's a little preceding part to this. How can you say God is good when there is so much evil and suffering in the world? You know, that, that's, that's some ways the, the question uh, arises. And Christians claim God is all-powerful, so why doesn't he fix the world? So you know, maybe, maybe there's questions like that. And it, there seems to be two irreconcilable concepts going on here. So you have a supreme, perfect creator, and you have a world in disarray. How can that, you know, to the, to the natural mind, you know, culture as a whole, that just doesn't seem to compute, right? Um, and usually during natural disasters, that's when you really... Uh, see the finger of blame pointed to God, right? Uh, where, was, where was God during this catastrophe? Whatever that is, hurricanes, tornadoes, whatever the natural disaster is. Um, why did God do this? They want to say that God did this. So that, that's another part. Maybe this is all the insurance company's fault because they, they have that disclaimer saying these are acts of God, right? Maybe that's just the cultural thinking. Um, that everything that goes awry in nature is God's fault. So, because we pay these fees for, you know, to cover ourselves during these times. But anyways, so uh, that's those are kind of the questions, right? We hear and talked about and debated, and and uh, we hear people who are, uh, you know, apolog and, and uh, into apologetics and apologists um, debate these kinds of things and speak on these kinds of things. And I am not one of those. Um, when I grow up, I want to be one maybe, but uh, yeah, there's, there's other people you can, can hear uh, speak much more smoothly on these topics um, and read. So uh, check those people out. You probably know who they are. We're going to look uh, at our present condition here. I don't think, I'm not going to be shedding any light on things you don't already know. I, I'm, I'm aware of that. Um, again, we're kind of preaching to the choir here, but um, our current condition Right? I, I didn't surprise you by this one, did I? We live in a fallen world. And this is the, the short answer right, to why there's evil and suffering in the world. That we live in a fallen world. Right? I'm not telling you anything. You don't know. God created, we know that God created this world in perfect order. He created man without sin. Right? Everything was great. And then free will comes into play, right? So God gave humanity, man, free will. 
And we know that Adam made the wrong choice, right? He made the wrong choice, and now we live in a world his bad choice created, right? So here we are, many, many years later. So some ask, why, why would God give us free will? Because none of what we're experiencing now and what Adam chose was not a surprise to God. He made plans before that um, of redeeming the world. So, but why did he give us free will? Like, knowing that this was going to be the result. And I think, I mean, just to kind of put it out there, pretty, I think I'm safe to say this, we'll not fully know this until the other side of eternity, until we get to heaven. We're going to find some things out. All the, all the, all the th- gaps are going to be filled in for us. So that's really it. Don't hurt your brain on trying to think about that. But uh, if God didn't give us free will, we would never really be fully human. And we would never really be fully made in the image of God. So we were given free will. Those are just two things I, I'm citing right here. Um, if we didn't have free will, if we were controlled, we would be a little robotic, right? Um, and that's, that's not the case here. So we're going to look at like evil in two categories, okay? Um, two different categories of evil. Um, you know, you can, there's plenty of subcategories. Um, but moral evil and natural evil. So moral evil, we'll just kind of define it as like, you know, think of your, your worst atrocities. Moral evil, murder, theft, rape. I always got to throw rape in there. War, carnage, etc. These are expressions of our sinful state. This, these moral evils are expressions of our sinful state that we that is present in this in this world. And then there's natural evil. So natural evil, what I kind of touched on, disasters, you know, natural disasters, accidents, calamities uh, in the physical world, and those are also results of a moral evil. All of this came out. It's all kind of tied together. And uh, that's what we're dealing with here. So after the fall, right, evil became so great, right, think Noah's Ark era, evil became so great it came to kind of like a head. God's judgment came against sin at this time in the form of a worldwide flood, right? And we know that Eight people were spared through this. So, um, but during and after that flood, just in, a, in the natural sense, that's when the earth's plates were not going to go down. I'm not going to go down any rabbit trails. I don't think I actually could in this, on my own in this sense. But you know, the earth, everything was just like, you can go back. There's, there's messages on what really took place during the flood. I mean, the earth's plates went nuts and shifted and crumbled and all this stuff and water was coming up from everywhere and coming down from everywhere and you know prior to that you probably heard it if you haven't it had never rained right it had never rained it was kind of like a greenhouse effect situation the earth was and then all of this stuff broke loose and and then uh, as a result of all that um you know the climate or the or the earth was drastically changed you have you know you're it brought forth uh the tsunamis, the tornadoes, the hurricanes, the earthquakes, all the stuff. And just, I think this is a, that was climate change. That was climate change. That, we don't know what climate change is. So, I think you could define that as, that was climate change. That was when the climate did change. So, there you go. Um, so that's just kind of like to kind of set a little foundation or lay a little base there. Um, that's what we're dealing with. So, so we just covered the moral evil and natural evil. So those are the, and it's all a product of that fallen state we're in through sin, that, that free will being exercised, and boom, here we are. I know this is an exciting message. Just calm down a little bit. All right, we're going to go to Romans 8. Romans 8. 
these are things you can bring up with people that you converse with about stuff like this, such deep things. Um, Romans 8.21 in the Passion Translation. This is regarding creation. All creation longs for freedom from its slavery to decay and experience with us the wonderful freedom coming to God's children. We're going to continue on in, in verse 22. It says, To this day we are aware of the universal agony and groaning of creation as if it were in contractions of labor for childbirth. So when God created the world, he saw that it was good, right? In the beginning, in creation, God saw everything and that it was good. And like the earth, it's, you know, the, there's verses tied to this. You know, all the earth is, is waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. And, and these scriptures talk about the earth groaning. And the earth itself is, is awaiting its redemption. Just as we are waiting the redemption of our mortal bodies. Right? So we're in the same situation, the same fallen state um, as far as our physical bodies go and, and, and the state of the earth. It just seems to be getting, there's more and more stuff. I, could, I had a few things I removed from my notes, just a lot of facts and figures and things and I was going down the road of you know, the increase of even earthquakes. It was like a 265% increase from not very long ago. I mean, just the, 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 the unrest of the planet, you know. Um, and it's, it's, it's tied to that wanting to be redeemed and freed from this fallen, chaotic state. But there's some interesting information. And little did I know, but I'm not going to like I erase these again from my notes, but the United States, according to NASA, has the worst natural disasters in the world. Like, it's crazy. And I'm thinking, we should praise God because it seems like a lot more people should have lost their lives based on all this information I'm reading. You know, tornadoes and all this stuff and thousands and all this. It was astronomical. But um, anyway, so that's, it's just like uh, kind of thrown out there, like the earth, the earth is groaning for that redemption and awaiting that redemption, just like, again, we are our physical bodies. And I have some good news. Um, Revelation 21.1, here's a little, I don't want to, usually when I end on good news, it's just an like exclamation point, and I will. But um, this is some great news. I can't just leave it out there. But Revelation 21.1 says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. So, it's coming, right? The best is yet to come. That's another, there's a great scripture on pointing to the best is yet to come. So one day we will be dwelling uh, in a new earth and experiencing new heaven. And uh, it's going to be awesome. So, I'll end with a, a, a scripture that kind of gives you some really good hope on that one. Um, so let's talk a little bit about suffering. I see you're all excited about that. Um, so suffering. We're humans. If you're not suffering, you're not human at some level, right? So every individual, every family, every culture has experienced suffering in an infinite amount of ways uh, as a result of, of sin. And we've heard even thought, you know, we, when we see things and we get this righteous indignation and all this stuff, especially when we see what, you know, when we see the innocent suffer. And we're seeing that right now across the globe, right? And hearing the atrocities in Israel and, and things of that nature. And it, it is a righteous indignation. You know, we, we hate to see that the most. And, you know, who's taking a step back? And I was, I was really, give me a little grace on kind of laying this out. Um, but as I was reading through this, uh, this study, referencing the materials I was referencing and stuff, um, you know, that 
innocent, the innocent suffer. Who's innocent? Technically, there's only been one innocent human that ever walked this planet. And his name was Jesus. Sinless and righteous. Now, I'm not saying there aren't innocent people who suffer. That's not what I'm saying. Whether you're innocent, guilty, whatever, suffering it knows no bounds. But God is the one who, you know, is, really is the only one who qualified to judge whether someone's innocent or guilty. But we know that that's a huge part of our, the issue is seeing that suffering imposed on or people going through that in our minds, that horrifying suffering, whatever that, that shows up like. But going back, Jesus was the only true innocent one. Um, we, unfortunately, and fortunately, there's a good and bad here, we were born into sin. We were born with the sin nature. We were born in Adam. And sin wreaked havoc in all of humanity. But thank God for Jesus. Jesus showed up. The last Adam, the second Adam, the last Adam. To redeem us. He became that sin that we couldn't get out of. He eradicated that sin that held us captive. And that's the freedom that He purchased for us at the cross. And he conquered death, hell, and the grave for us when He rose again. And that's the good news. That humanity's, humanity's suffering in reality was self-inflicted. And you might thinking, it wasn't my fault. I wasn't back there. I wouldn't have did that. That's funny. I think we all would have done that. But humanity's suffering was self-inflicted. And you know you can reject that or statement or whatever, but it's it really was. Um, I'm just kind of pointing out factual things here, I'm not pointing at anybody. But suffering originated again as a result of free will being exercised and choosing to rebel against God, choosing sin. And of course, when sin came, death reigned. Right? All of the fruit of sin. Disease, sickness, death, all the stuff related to sin went nuts. Let's go, that's enough on suffering. Um, let's go back to Romans 8. So Romans 8, 28. It says, And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to His purpose for them. I've prayed this prayer and, and I pray this scripture and, and I declare this scripture and even in those moments where it looks not good, you know, like I don't know what's going to happen here or what are the outcomes going to be, but God's going to work this out for my good, whatever this is going to turn out to be. And even in the midst of, of suffering, like you're just like, why in the heck is this happening? It could be a self. I mean, I felt like I was suffering every day last week at work. I'm like, man, every day is a stinking Monday. You know, and I'm not one of those guys with Blue Monday stuff. I don't, I'm not that guy. But it was like those stereotypical Mondays, you know, everybody kind of refers to, seemed to happen every day last week. I'm like, no, this is horrible. I'm suffering. But no, that's laughable. Um, but, you know, it, in the midst of whatever we're going on, wherever we're going through, we do have this, this is a promise we have that. God wants to be invited into whatever you're going through. And He wants us to completely, fully trust in and rely on Him to walk through this, to get through this or whatever. Um, there was a list of about 20 things I was reading through this study. And I was, I was kind of going back and forth. Sorry, I'm sharing a little too much of my behind the scenes. But going back and forth, do I touch on this? Do I not? So I'm going to just, I took a, grabbed a few, okay, in regards to suffering. And I'm not saying suffering is good, but 
some good things could be a result of going through some suffering. I don't know. I, I took some things that maybe applied to me and maybe they apply to you or whatever. And This list is much longer. But some things that can come out of suffering in our lives. Uh, one, it can uncover uh, what is really in, in our hearts. It can expose our hearts. How many knows the Bible says that out of our hearts come all the issues of our life? And so if you don't like the issues in your life, what's going in your heart? What's coming out of your heart? And we know what's in your heart by what comes out of your mouth. Right? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So it could reveal or uncover some things that are in our heart and we can deal with them. We might be thinking this is the cause and maybe the root is in our heart and, and that is shown up in that in that suffering. Uh, another thing suffering can do in our lives, it can break us of our pride. Um, you can think about that one on your own, but I, I'm thinking of instances in my life where maybe I've been through some self-inflicted suffering and it really would, broke down to, came down to the fact that I was just, it was my own pride, whatever that was. Um, I'm not going to share any specific examples, but that is one thing suffering can do. I guess a, a, a good thing that can come out of it. Uh, it can deepen our desire for God. Um, or lead us kind of like, maybe just throwing the towel, but like, that's it, I'm going to, I'm pressing into God. Oh, is that what, you know, took this much, you just, you know, it's like the old adage, it, oh, it's come to this, now we've got to pray. You know, it's one of those things. So it could, it could, draw you in, into a deeper place, desire to press into God. It can mature us. Suffering can mature us. And there's probably some cases you can think of that. Um, again, I'm, I kind of picked things out in my own life. Like, yep, mm -hmm. I think this applies to me or it has applied to me. Uh, it, it may prompt a lost person to receive Jesus. You know, the, the old cliche, I've, I'm at the bottom of the barrel. Only way is up. Cry out to God, all that stuff, right? So that, that may be the result of that. Um, it can lead a person into Christian ministry. Maybe suffering, maybe, maybe witnessing people suffering, whether that's, you know, think of Mother Teresa. You know, things of that nature. That's a pretty prime example, I guess. But seeing people in suffering can lead you into that place of your heart is drawn in there and God gives you a heart for whatever that people group is, whatever that situation is. But it can lead a person into a place of ministry, suffering. Or maybe you've gone through things in your own life and God has freed you from it, whether it be addiction, whether it be fill in the blank, whatever. And you have you, you experienced suffering through those areas in your life, and now God wants to use you to be in that suffering with other people and see them freed up as well. So that's another good thing, that, that thing working together for good, you know, that, that can come out of that. Is, and everybody probably knows plenty of people in ministry that have those stories. Like I was, you know, whether it be drug addiction, whatever addiction, things, um, abuse, whatever, and now they're being used in that very same arena in life. And that's, and that's a good thing. And, and God graces them to, to walk in that. So that's just um, a little, uh, I think that was, a, a little, we'll call that a period on the end of the suffering thing. But Jesus suffered for us, right? Are we, are we grateful for that? Jesus suffered for us. Jesus, the innocent one, right? He was the only innocent one who ever walked on this planet. The only righteous one. And thank God we have been made righteous with his righteousness. And uh, that is a beautiful thing. And Jesus allowed himself to be murdered by his creation. That doesn't make any more sense to us almost than why is there suffering in this, you know, good God suffering in the world. It's... It, that's another thing that doesn't really compute that Jesus allowed himself to be murdered by his own creations, by suffering on a, on a cross for, human, for 
a humanity that was guilty. He was he 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 laid his life down through that and through Jesus victory over sin, death, hell and the grave, the world was given a guaranteed hope of freedom from the bondage of sin when they put their trust in him. And that is the good news of the gospel that we didn't have to pay. He paid the price. He became sin. He who knew no sin became our sin. That we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. And that was that, that free gift of his righteousness. There's a theologian, I'm totally not familiar with this person, um, but I found it an interesting read. A little. I'm just going to read a little uh, quote, a little writing I did. And you can take or leave some of the things in here. I wasn't fully sure. I was going to slice and dice it up a little bit, but... I'm just going to read it, and you can throw out what you don't like and take what you do like, right? So, there's kind of an interesting, uh, interesting thought on the, on this subject of of Jesus suffering and and laying down his life for humanity. It says, for whatever reason, God chose to make man as he is, limited and suffering and subject to sorrows and death. He had the honesty and courage to take his own medicine, so God became one of us. He became the humanity that rejected him. He has himself gone through the whole of human experience. From the trivial irritations of family life and the cramping restrictions of hard work and lack of money to the worst horrors of pain, humiliation, defeat, despair, and death. So Jesus is well acquainted with our humanity. And we know there's scripture to reflect that. Finally, it says when he, this, this gal, Dorothy Sears, finally she says, when he was a man, he played a man. He was born in poverty and died in disgrace and he thought it well worthwhile. And for the joy that was set before him, the Bible says, he endured the cross and you were the joy that was set before him. You were worth his suffering. He considered you worth that suffering, that anguish, that pain, everything he went through on the cross. You were well worth it. I just thought that was, uh, I had never heard that before. Or it, was, it kind of punched me you know, a little bit at the end. Where he thought it was well worth well worthwhile, just the wording of that. We were all worthwhile. We were all worth it to him. And uh, that is just the beauty of his love for us. Um, I'm just gonna close on a couple couple things just to kind of point to, and then I'm gonna also read a couple um, scriptures that I'd like to end with. Just a little so in a little hope. So in God, God gave us graciously His Word to guide us through this life. He gave us Holy Spirit as our teacher, as our helper, as our comforter, to lead us. The Gospel of John says, Holy Spirit leads us into all truth. So we have countless examples of suffering and people walking through suffering in the Word of God. And, you know, I could say I've, I've said it plenty, but you know, smart is learning from your mistakes. Wisdom is learning from others' mistakes, right? So even by just looking at, in our own lives, looking at examples in the Word of God, or even examples in our own life, or people who have walked through things, and we can avoid much suffering by taking uh, lessons from their own life, and lessons from from the Word. And, and maybe maybe our suffering, and our maybe Maybe we're experiencing suffering in our life and maybe it's self-induced not to be, you know, whatever that would be, being. Um, I know I've gone through plenty of self-induced suffering in my life, just doing things that I knew not to do, but I did them anyways, right? I think we can all, we can all raise our hand if I wanted to take a show of hands, uh, that we've all, all been there. And, and there's this book, and I've referenced it, you can never tell somebody you need to read this book. But, in a congregational setting, I can. So, <laughs> but, you know, maybe 
suffering in your life. Maybe it's self-induced or because of maybe self-centeredness. How many knows Andrew Womack has a book called Self-Centeredness, The Source of All Grief? I think about that a lot. Uh, then I try to make that almost an annual read for myself. If I'm living in misery at any given moment, is this self-centered? Is this a root of self-centeredness in my life? I should uh, brush up on my, my reading of that, that book. I'm just kind of throwing that out there. And to kind of um, point out something that Pastor Chad said, he's mentioned a few times, um, since we've been doing the Wednesday night study, uh, a biblical worldview and this sessions on sexuality, and Pastor Chad has raised the question, like, what if in this topic, in, in the topic of sexuality, what if the world did it God's way? And I started thinking in terms of suffering and evils and all that stuff and how much suffering would not be if the world just walked in God's way when it came to sexuality. There wouldn't be, he's pointed out, he went through the list, you know, there wouldn't be abortion, there wouldn't be adultery, there wouldn't be abuse, sexual abuse, there wouldn't be all of the things related to, there wouldn't be the the extreme depression and levels of suicide and people who are confused about sexuality, who are, you know, there's those certain groups that statistically have a horrible um, level of, of suicide and depression and all that. All of those things related to doing things our way in our own um, of our own free will outside of a biblical worldview. You know, just, just, I was just thinking through that, of course, in this topic of suffering, just in, in, in the way of, and how many other arenas we've, we've gone through and other series of biblical worldviews, and that's really, as believers in Christ, as, as His kids, that's what we need to walk in is a biblical worldview because that is God's best for us. He always wants the best for us. I mean, we're not going to avoid suffering at every level, but the more we seek His best, the more we seek His ways, the more we, we sow the Word of God in our hearts and renew our minds to having a biblical worldview, the less suffering that we'll, we will taste of, I believe. Um, there are plenty of scriptures that kind of boggle your mind, like, if you do this, this, and this, you'll never fall. Um, those who walk in the fear of the Lord will not be visited with evil. There's some scriptures that are like, hmm? Like, that's interesting. So, um, those are other topics though. But, um, I just thought that was notable uh, to point out. But, regarding, you know, again, this was a one word answer, right? Why is there suffering and evil in the world? It's because of, the, of our fallen state. Our sin, is because of sin. And it exists. And one day the whole earth will be redeemed. We will be redeemed. And new heaven, new earth. All the good stuff, right? Um, there's a, two scriptures and I meant to put these in the end of my notes and I did not, but I remembered during praise and worship. So I'm just going to kind of leave us with these. We can close in prayer and then um, we will end in uh, one final worship song. So Romans 8.18 says, For... I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And you know who wrote that? Someone who suffered way more than we ever will. Paul went through some stuff. I would have, I mean, I'm not trying to be funny, but if suicide would have creeped up in my mind a few times. All the stuff he went through, you know, like, the beatings, the, the scourgings, the, all the, the horrifying stuff he went through, but he considered it all nothing. Uh, unworthy to be compared with the glory that was going to be revealed in us. And he is, of course, tasting of that. And, and then finally, James 4.14 in the Amplified, it says, Yet you do not know the least thing about what may happen tomorrow. What is the nature of of your life. You are really but a wisp of vapor, a puff of smoke, a mist that is visible for a little while 
and then disappears into thin air. So even in our suffering, this verse talks about our whole life as being a vapor, a mist. Gone. And then the moments of what are, what are the moments of our suffering compared to that? If it's if our whole life is a vapor, what is the suffering? It's just and that's why Paul can say what he said. Like he doesn't even consider it worth comparing to the glory. And and we have an eternal hope. In Jesus. We have an eternal hope. We're, we can't escape levels of suffering in our life. And it's, but He doesn't, the good thing is God never, He doesn't leave us alone. He joins us in it. He walks with us through it. Whatever that looks like in your life. And I'm, I'm not, I hope I didn't at any point come across as diminishing or belittling or whatever suffering in this world. Because it's, it's horrifying. It's horrifying. And the, but the good news is, one day it will come to an end. One day we will be redeemed. One day there will be a new heaven and a new earth. And we have an eternal hope. And, and we need to display that joy of that, expect, that expectancy we have to the world who is looking for that hope who's looking for that answer. And, you know, maybe, may, we, may we be available to join people in their suffering. May we be available and sensitive to come alongside, whether it's brothers and sisters in Christ, co-workers, whoever, whoever is in our life. You know, we all have our own circles, our own spheres that we live and walk in each day. But may we be sensitive to suffering around us and reach out and reach in and be available to maybe walk through stuff with people and uh, give them hope and and be Jesus to them. So that's all I have. But um, and that that kind of concludes this. And you know whether I well, if that went smooth or not. But um, God is good. And uh, and I'm so grateful for His choice in suffering for us and uh, paying the price that we we couldn't we couldn't pay, but uh, and embracing us, embracing humanity, even though we were the enemies. Uh, he came chasing after us with an unabandoned love, and I'm so grateful for that. And I know you are as well. So let's. You've been listening to a message from Karis New Testament Church. For more information or to contact us, go to www.karisntc.org. And remember, you are deeply loved, highly favored, and destined to reign in Christ Jesus.